So in this video, we'll take a little bit of time to talk about number six from the 2024 AP Stats FRQ set. So number six is your investigative task. It's going to take more time. It's going to be worth a bigger portion of your overall test score than any of the other FRQs. So definitely one to pay attention to. So in 2024, we have a situation where a company is selling a certain type of whistle. The price of the whistle is going to vary from store to store. Julio is a statistician for the company and wants to estimate the mean price in dollars of this type of whistle at all stores that sell the whistle. Part 1 of Part A asks us to identify the appropriate inference procedure for Julio to use. Well, it flat out tells us that Julio wants to estimate the mean price at all the stores that, es that sell the whistle. Now, if we're trying to estimate an unknown mean or an unknown proportion, in this case it's a mean, we're definitely going to build a confidence interval. Now, in this case, it's going to be a confidence interval for a population mean. Now, with means, you do have to decide whether or not you're dealing with a Z interval or a T interval. There's only going to be one sample here. Uh, if you look ahead in the problem, you can definitely determine that that's the case. Uh, but you do have to make the designation between using a Z interval or a T interval. Now, I have a T interval selected here because there's no reference at all, and you can flip ahead throughout the rest of the portions of the problem, there's no reference at all to the population standard deviation. You would only ever use a normal distribution and a Z interval if you have access to that population standard deviation. Since we do not know that, we're going with a one sample T interval to estimate this unknown population mean. Now part two of part A asks us to describe the parameter for the inference procedure that we identified in part A, part one of part A. And this is an unknown population mean, so it is going to be represented by the Greek letter mu, and mu is going to be the mean price measured in dollars of all the stores that sell this whistle. Before part B, they present us with a little bit of information. They tell us that Julio calls 20 randomly selected stores, and we have a dot plot representing the price of the whistle at these 20 stores. And we also have some summary statistics for those 20 selected stores for the price of this whistle. Now what part B asks us to do is they ask us to describe the shape of the distribution. Now, if it's if it was asking you to describe the distribution, you'd have to comment on shape, outliers, center, and spread. Uh, but in this case, we want to describe the shape of the distribution. And so if we look at what we've got going on in the dot plot, we have the peak of the data over here, but we have definitely a, a tail that's being dragged out to the right. So it should be pretty obvious that we have a right skewed distribution. It, it is unimodal, but the key characteristic here is that there's a right skew to it. Now, it does go on to say, justify your response by using appropriate values from the summary statistics table. Now, if you have data that is skewed to the right, as this one is, the mean is going to be inflated due to all these values on the higher end of the data set, while the median is going to stay resistant to that skewness. So that's exactly what I said. I used the, the values from the summary statistics. The right skewed shape is going to be supported by the fact that the mean is larger than the median. The mean is going to get inflated by that right skew, while the median will remain resistant to that skewness. So that was my argument with the summary statistics as to why we had that right skew. Now part two of part B says to use the one and a half times the interquartile range rule to determine whether we have any outliers within the sample. Justify your response. So. You want to show your work for determining the lower boundary and the upper boundary for outliers. So I'm taking the lower quartile value and I'm going down by one and a half interquartile ranges. Now the way you're finding this interquartile range is you're, you're taking the Q3 value and you're subtracting the Q1 value. So if you do that here, what you end up with is you end up with 0.965. So if I go down from Q1 by one and a half interquartile ranges, I get $3.06 as my lower boundary for outliers. And then my upper boundary for outliers is going to be established by going that distance, one and a half interquartile ranges above the upper quartile. So the upper quartile was $5.48. And if I go one and a half interquartile ranges above that, I'm left with $6.92. And if we look at the data, 
the, the dot plot specifically, there is not a whistle price set that is beneath $4.20 nor above $6.60 because we don't have any values below this lower boundary nor above this upper boundary. This data set does not have any outliers. What happens in number six? You have some things that should be pretty familiar, things you've done in your AP stats course, and then something new not that difficult, but something new is typically introduced within that problem. And this is obviously where that happens from 2024, number six. So it says it's sometimes difficult to determine whether the distribution of the sample data is skewed simply by looking at the graph of the data, particularly when we have a small sample size. So we have a measure called Pearson's coefficient of skewness, which is calculated using this formula. So a pretty simple formula, three times the difference between the sample mean and the median divided by the sample standard deviation. So in the first part of part C, they ask us to calculate Pearson's coefficient of skewness for Julio's sample size, sample size of 20 and show the work. So I basically just have the mean and the median plugged into the formula divided by the standard deviation. All of these values are, are from this set of summary statistics from back prior to part B. Uh, and what we end up with is we end up with roughly 0.95 for Pearson's coefficient of skewness for this sample. Now the second part of part C is showing us a graph and based on where your particular coordinates fall within the graph is going to allow you to make a judgment as to whether or not your data set is considered strongly skewed. So if your coordinates end up in the shaded section of the graph, we are going to have an approximately symmetric distri distribution for that sample data. But if we end up outside the shaded region, we are going to have a strongly skewed data set. So the second part of part C asks us to mark an X on the graph where our value for Pearson's coefficient of skewness along with our sample size ends up. So we see sample size plotted on the y-axis, we see Pearson's coefficient of skewness on the x-axis. Our value was 0.95 roughly, so somewhere in this stretch of the x-axis, and our sample size was 20, so I simply marked an x on the graph right there showing where this sample along with the, co with the coordinating Pearson's coefficient of skewness ended up. Obviously, we are outside of the shaded section, meaning that this should be the conclusion that we draw. We do have our sample data uh, considered to be strongly skewed, and we realize that just by looking at the data back in Part B. Now, the last part of this says, okay, refer back to what you did in Part C. What should you conclude about the shape of the distribution of whistle prices? In the sample, justify your response. Well, we just kind of said this. Our coordinates on that graph lied outside of the shaded section. Because of that, we would have the conclusion that we have a distribution of sample data that is strongly skewed. Part D goes on to say the inference procedure that we identified back in Part A needs one of the following requirements to satisfy that we have an approximately normal sampling distribution. Uh, the sample size is greater than or equal to 30. That would be the, the central limit theorem, right? If we have a, a sample size that's greater than or equal to 30, our sampling distribution for our sample mean is going to be approximately normal. That is obviously not satisfied, right? Our sample size is 20, so we clearly violate that first bullet point. But if the sample size is less than 30, we can look for other evidence that suggests that we might have an approximately normal sampling distribution for our sample mean. That other information would require that we do not have a strong skew and we do not have outliers. Well, clearly back in part one of part D, our conclusion is that we do have a strongly skewed set of sample data. Even though we don't have outliers, as we indicated back in one of the prior parts of the problem, we do have strong skewness. Because of that, we don't have the normality condition satisfied, and Julio should not proceed with the inference procedure that we referenced back in Part A.